tonight. Um, it's already Black History Month with the English Department. Um, when we were discussing what to do to celebrate Black History Month through literature, the first person that came to my mind was Mr. C. Lee McInnes. Um, he's always inspiring, and I love his poetry, and he just embodies um, everything that we're going to talk about tonight, and I was super excited about that, and he agreed. Um, Mr. McInnes is a poet, a short story writer, and an instructor of English at JSU. He is the former publisher and editor of Black Magnolia's Literary Journal, and he's the author of eight books. Um, he has lectured and read his poetry at conferences and events around the country, and in 2009, he was invited by the NAACP to read poetry in Washington, D.C. for their inaugural poetry reading celebrating the election of President Barack Obama. Um, Mr. McInnes is an incredible writer, and through his poetry, he embodies the pride of Mississippi while also acknowledging her dark past. He is my favorite modern author and poet, and he is always an inspiring speaker. So please welcome Mr. McKinnis. We are soldiers in the army. We have to fight, although we have to cry. We have to hold up the bloodstained banner. We have to hold it up until we... This is not a protest poem. This is not a protest poem because I'll let it be sweetened like tea to get published because stainless steel substance is secondary to strawberry flavor style and secondary to scientific surgical skill. It's always secondary to dime store magic of acceptance and everything is acceptable to paying rent and living next to people who used to own you. This is not a protest poem because see, we think that God can be cast in on the 1st and the 15th and that love can be put on layaway while we be on our knees and backs laying away our lives, taking the iron shaft of colonialism into our pimped out morals as we allow ourselves to be impregnated with the virus of self emergence stemming from the bright hot light of the white normative gaze. This is not a protest poem because organic to protest is the voice. And I keep ignoring the irreconcilable differences between me and my counterfeit country because I love chicken, Cadillacs, and concubines more than the clean air of autonomy. And I'll swap my freedom for a job. I'll sell my liberation for a car. And I'll bark to my self-determination for a full BB plan. This is not a protest poem because I have not sat in the sun with Ebony Babies playing ABCs and one, two, threes and Mama May I if you please and I have not told a black boy that he is an apple. I have not told a black girl that she is a flower. Not with my empty maggot filled words but by teaching them how to read and count and love themselves more than they love the lie of Charlton Heston's white knight fallacy. This is not a protest poem because I'm not willing to stop. Stop funding my oppressor's war chest because french fries, cola, and tennis shoes are more valuable to the bank of my soul than dignity. Stop looking at the backside of my woman too long enough to see the inside of her glory. Stop being afraid of the cloudy shadow of unemployment and the burning brand of low class status. Stop lying that living like the oppressor doesn't mean justifying the bulldozing of another bronze body. This is not a protest poem because I continue to be made a mental paraplegic by the State Department of Education, fleeced by the finances of Discover Card and malnourished by Burger King and suffocated into surrender by Am South Bank. This is not a protest poem because love is not my cast iron crest. Not that televisional falsehood of universal nothing is what we win when whites realize just how white blacks can be as Desdemona's quantitative affection for that black ram and his ability to pour himself into the box of a white sheep. See, love is not letting Fannie Lou Hamer die broke. Love is going to a little league baseball game when you'd rather spend Saturday in a sleep-induced coma. Love is staying awake at that PTA meeting after spending all day working the game change ship. Love is buying a child's winter coat when you want that new iPod 10. Love is breaking adult conversation to hit a summer breeze of a child's arbitrary outburst. Love is laying out the pants of your lover's too tight slacks. <laughs> Love has no ulterior motive other than to grow flowers of self-esteem in our hearts. Love is not dependent on what brain-dead mockingbirds do or say because you was once a brain-dead mockingbird and we love your back of flying butt too. <laughs> love is not fleeting like a cheap $20 high, not fleeting like last season's designer suit. Love is not fleeting like 15 minutes of sexual bliss. Love is not being afraid to die broke. 
Love is swimming through the ugly reality to be baptized in a beautiful truth. Love is an action verb with limitless amounts of conjugation. See, this cannot be no protest poem because we be not protesting the lack of love. When will we protest ourselves for allowing love to fade away like last year's hit record? Can we boycott men who don't want to be sons to their seeds? Can we sit in schools with no community curriculum? Can we picket religions that do not feed the hungry? Can we boycott preachers who deliver Pharaoh's message? Can we sit in parties that use our platform as fertilizer fuel for their machine and use our bodies as target practice to show how middle of the road they are? Can we picket politicians who lie in their pockets with Judas's gold? Can we boycott lawyers whose hands are stained with the soil blood of the heirs case? See, this ain't no protest poem because I be too inebriated off of the glass pipe of glass classism. See, this ain't no protest poem because all of the Protestants have invested in Satan's mutual funds. This ain't no protest poem because the age of enlightenment made a deity of capitalism as we continue to kneel at the altar of a wool market. This ain't no protest poem because, see, I ain't willing to handle by carrying you in the name of black babies. This ain't no protest poem because I'm not willing to dent my greasy you in the name of black liberation. This ain't no protest poem because I'm not willing to nat turn you in the name of black women. This ain't no protest poem because I'm not willing to do something over to you in the name of black love. This ain't no protest poem because I continue to vote for oatmeal politicians who have memorized King's speeches while they vomit on his principles. This ain't no protest poem because I allow the cities to be prostituted by poor pit pimps and pyramid scam revolutionary poems. This is not a protest poem because revolution begins with the fertile foundation of family. Families are the atoms in society's molecular structure. Families are single cell organisms of the community's ecosystem. Families are the mustard seed of the national oak tree. 20 years of integration, capitalism, and crack weigh heavier on our families than the steel tonnage of 400 years of slavery. Our families sit like abandoned houses on dead end streets, pillaged and plundered by smoked out transits and blind mice leaders. Our families linger like decimated neighborhoods filled with dysfunctional neighbors. Our families give us as much chance as an illiterate man in a speed reading contest. This is not a protest poem because the clay of familyhood has not been restructured. When we celebrate families, we will mass protest our destruction. When we build families, we will demolish the straw hut of self-hate. When we nurture families, we will provide kernels of nationhood. When we fix the foundation of families, we will build a mighty army for Cookie Shakalia. This is not a protest poem because had this been a protest poem, each and every one of you would be filling with the swelling resolve to find the buried treasure of love and plant it into the soul of our families. Thank you. <laughs> West Jackson is, 
both a very beautiful place and a very traumatic place, right? How do you deal with that beauty and that, and that trauma? So this poem, there were a couple, I was, I, just, I did two years in the uh, creative writing program at USM working on the doctor. I, I didn't finish, uh, and so this was one of the poems that I wrote while I was in that program, which ended up being in my first book. It's called Children of Trouble, and so I'll just read it. Trouble's children, dining on the entree of decayed dreams, facing their flowering age, doing the vandalism of their minds. People backhanded with the backlash of their rotten seeds. We are the boards of intellectualism, grinded like mice meat in mercantilism's machine. We got to sanitize our souls instead of smothering them with a lumpy religion with a mummifying hole. Desperately drowning people in the cesspool of capitalism, reaching for salvation, finding flawed flotation devices, hopeful of holes to save on overhead. Laughing children with plastic smiles of insanity, crying children soaked with realities, lemon bitter and salty tears, never realized that what they lost wasn't never really worth having. Thrown away trash of society, searching for their roots of their fallen tree, branching out without direction, never growing, only devolving into shells of shadows. The age of reason is devoid of logic. Justification allows sleep to serve as a proper religion. Ours is the want of a heaping serving of nothing more than a side of spicy naivety. Iron souls move along to a rhythm absent of groove, claim loudly with a bridge that leads to nowhere. Paper hearts filled with the hollow rhetoric of their times that turns on them like termites when thinking is beckoned. Frantic fanatics on fire for Jehovah's finances call upon God to do their dirty work as they keep their hands free for salvation. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a piece, uh, an essay presentation about uh, occasional poetry, right? And if you're like me, the first time you heard the term occasional poetry, so much, you write occasional poetry? Yeah, I write poetry occasionally. <laughs> Jesus smiles at me from the cross. I find myself kneeling before the 
his cheek east to add. His crimson, his crimson, crimson drops ferociously upon me, burning welts and holes into the skin of my resistance. Jesus is chasing me. He wants his spokesman. No, he wants my borrowed soul. I won't give it to him. He'll kill me for it, because Jesus is, is, is medieval. <laughs> I don't want to expire. My soul is nauseous. My flesh crawls with creeping consternation. Jesus wants me. You know, all governments need expendable soldiers. Leave me alone, rings from my ego. He mocks my flaming ignorance with his smothering love. He makes me feel the thorns against his head. He smiles and waits. Jesus is chasing me, my mouth is dry. My throat feels like hot razors sucking in the evaporating air and wind. My belly burns of the hot coals, which is the seething starvation of lacking scripture. It growls and grumbles, vibrating throughout me. My head palpitates viciously from hunger. My sweaty, swollen feet burn at one million miles, aching to the bone, twitching and throbbing with every step. Go away! The roots of my phallus demands, even though I run from him, he prepares a table for my misdirected, my misdirected journey. I stop, I sit, I rest, I eat. My belly is full of the fruits of his juicy charity. He mocks me with his covenant. Like prey whose predator is gaining on him, every ounce of me being used to elude him. My quicksanding steps multiply. I glance back through the dust of my speed and realize he's gaining on me. His hand is on my shoulder. One hand is on both shoulders. Wait, one hand on both shoulders? And I guess it is Jesus. <laughs> he won't let go. It's a long run from Jesus. I give him the slip down the alley, around the corner, you know, into that liquor store. That house of ill repute. He will never find me in here. A skinny black girl with hair of wool gazes into my eyes. She takes me home. We wash each other's feet. We break wheat bread together. There is more fish than I could ever eat. Time undresses who I was. She takes my name and gives me her wound. She saves my soul. Thank you. How many people for me with the rock group Living Color? Anybody know Living Color? All right, so, all right, so, uh, you know, poems and short stories don't always pay the bills. <laughs> so I, I wrote a lot of uh, uh, articles as a music critic. And I was like, I'm, I'm a blues boy. I'm a blues boy, rock guy, and a funk guy. That's me. I'm blues, rock, and funk. And so uh, my, I wrote for a magazine, Goldmine Magazine, a couple other magazines. And so I was the black rock guy. Right. So I wrote about living color, fishbone, mother's <laughs> Prince, right? You know, so I was like, I write about rock music. Good. We need somebody to write about these black people, don't nobody else write about them. <laughs> and and I would have been offended, but I was broke. So <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, let me cat let me crabs, give me them two. <laughs> so so this is a uh the poem is pretty self-explanatory, but it's it's it, it's pretty self-explanatory, so we can discuss it. But it, it, it begins with an epigraph from a living color song uh, titled Broken Memories. And unfortunately for you, I don't want to sing it. <laughs> you understand why I say unfortunately for you in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> now you can tear a building down, but you can't erase a memory. These houses may look all run down, but they have a value. You can't see. Open another to a college professor. Just because you refuse to teach them, did you really think they would evaporate like forgotten rain? Don't you know that every branch has a root and that nature makes every bird return to the place of the nest? As a forest, we still hear echoes, even though most of our ears are filled with your chalky cotton lines. But just as sure as we stand, we will be able to decipher Phyllis's distorted voice. Yet you tell us that we did not inscribe, that slavery was our prelude into civilization. Yet the walls of the echoing now river tombs are the preference to the entire world. And still you made us mute, when we've been double-tongued from the Genesis. And yet you treat us, brothers, like Oliva and Brianna was a weak limb on the tree of Western expansion. So many black minds with your pasty PhDs, yet not one course you require in us. Do you wonder why we're on fire? A lifetime spent in study and not one semester spent on me. Yet we continue to find a lush lexicon for our lives. My mind has been sentenced to six hours in Europe with only a weekend pass to Africa. You 
you want me to be a bastard child and hide that you're that you are Dr. Seuss's thief that lurks in the night. But you give me the 28 days to catch up on scribes when you shut up by deleting their names from the rolls of Caucasian curriculums. Out your doors, keep on appearing. You're not in suits, in t-shirts, blue jeans, and earrings. The soul of the people will not be damned, but it will continue to flow, washing away your mist. Your abridged anthologies can't erase the fact that we were here. Like air and soil, we won't disappear, even if polluted by your evil. We refuse to be eaten and swallowed by your bale wolf assimilation. Without homes, a nation, or patrons, we managed to perpetuate our narrative, signifying who the real monkey is, restoring Eshu to the heavens. Thank you. Yeah. So for a couple of that, uh, one thing at the end, restoring Eshu to the heavens, if you know, so Eshu is uh, one of the minor gods, well not minor gods, he's one of the gods in your religion, and Eshu is the god who is his job to take what the major gods are saying and transcribe it to the lower gods. And so that's kind of what I see writers, right? That's our job is to kind of talk, we talk for the people to the powers that be, right? And let the powers that be know what time it is for the people. And so, and the other is we transcribe Phyllis's uh, code, that's uh, Phyllis Wheaton, right? So Phyllis Wheaton being the first black person to publish a collection of poetry. Uh, we can't forget about Lucy Terry's Bar Swipe, right? The very first uh, poem by Black African American. All right, so a couple more, and then um, I want to do a little talking, and then maybe one more poem. So I have two more poems, and then I'll see if you have any questions. And if you don't have any questions, then I'm just going to rash you with my poetry. So you can start. <laughs> uh, see, I didn't do it every time. Right? Right. So this is a poem. Um, a lot of my poems that are published were poems that people ask me to write. Now, I, you know, uh, I was going to read. I was going to read another poem. I should have brought the other poems too. I should have. I, 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 I didn't. Uh, do we, how many, how many remember when the uh, we had that tragic killing of the of the young white kids who were coming to Jackson and assault uh, black citizens, and so they dragged and killed the young man. I actually wrote a poem about that. I got the poem published. But that poem, part of the, the story behind that poem is that I hadn't actually planned to write about that. A former student of mine, actually she was the first head of Outspoken, which is the poetry group at Jackson State, she emailed me, and her email to me was just so moving, right? And she, and she, like throughout the email, she just kept saying, well, Miss McGinnis, what are you gonna say about this? Right, like, you know, she was waiting, and for those of you who don't know, I have this listserv, uh, that again, that I just bother people with emails. If you're on the list, you're a couple of folks and you're on their email list. And so it's usually about upcoming events, what's happening. So if anyone went on the list to know about what kind of upcoming events. But if something happens around the city, I'll, I'll write about it. And so a couple of days had passed, and I guess I had said anything, and she was determined to make me say something. So for me, the real backstory in that poem is that yeah, that's the point that got published, and, and that's something that needs to be highlighted. But it's really important why older people have to be in constant contact with young people, right? It, 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 we have to have these intergenerational dialogues because you young people breathe life into us. And I know old people, we can be annoying and aggravating y'all, I know we can, but just so y'all know, just like y'all talk about us behind our back, we talk about y'all too, so. <laughs> just so you know, like y'all, you know Dr. So-and-so is a jerk. Yeah, when we get to teach them now, we go, you know that Johnson boy is a jerk, right? That's <laughs> what we it is, we say, but we gotta have, so I should have brought it, you know, but I didn't. So, uh, this poem is one of the first poems I was actually asked to write, and it's, uh, my, my last book is with Hollis Watkins. Hollis Watkins uh, was with SNCC, he was a, um, uh, field secretary for SNCC, and he helped organize Freedom Summit, did a lot of other things, and so I have uh, Hollis write his book, uh, Brother Hollis, the Sankofa, Sankofa Movement Man. Well, Hollis would just walk up to me and just say, I need to write a poem about X, right? And then he would make up an event, right, to make me do it. Well, we gonna have this event, so you need to have this poem by, <laughs> right, such and such. I didn't realize that, that that's what he was doing, but just kind of, you know, I was, I wanted to be a tree poet, right? What's really funny about me is that for years, I was the angry African-American poet, which was, and choice to write, which was, I mean, you know, when I went back and I read some of the stuff, I wrote, yeah, I was really angry, yeah, I'm really mad at that title. But I wanted to be a transcendentalist. Right. I love the role. I love him. That's what I want to be. Right. In fact, and some of you will notice my, my favorite, and I want to get it right. So my favorite quote is this the role was in jail. And Emerson went to visit the role. Right? Because it was something with the land and they were like, and so Emerson said, 
is, Thoreau not a good man. Why are you in jail? And who knows what did Thoreau say? Empty. Why are you out there? Why are you out of jail? <laughs> right? And that always said to me what a writer should be. So that's really kind of what I want to be. I wasn't going to be as political as Thoreau. Let me be clear. I was <laughs> Y'all liberation is on me going to jail. Y'all didn't get no <laughs> Now, I say it because my father ended up in Vietnam, not because he was drafted. My father was so involved in the Mississippi movement that a white sheriff went to my grandfather's house and basically said, if that little red N-word is here next week, he's going to be real familiar with the truth. So my grandfather thought Vietnam was safer than Mississippi. <laughs> So my father goes to Vietnam, he comes back, and of course he didn't learn his lesson because he was a young knucklehead. And he gets involved in the movement again. And so that was a day when they arrested so many black people uh, who were rallying for different issues, was doing the downtown bus boycott, that they ran out of rooms in the jail. And they had to house them at the Coliseum where they had a rodeo. So that, my father was in that group. So that was my father. So I, I was raised around and raised up in that. I got to college, I was like, yes, um, enough of that. I'm going to write these street poems. And, but Hollis knew my father. And everybody else older than me knew my father. And so for them, they were like, oh, that's Max Boy. Right? That, no, in fact, that, that's Claude's boy. My first name was Claude, last name Boy. That was my name, Claude Boy. <laughs> right? I tell people my name is Sidney Mackenzie. Yeah, Claude's Boy, that's your name. <laughs> so I, I was always end up writing these poems about different events. And so this poem was the first poem that Hollis had me write. And it's been. For the longest time, it was my most published poem. Uh, it's titled Mississippi Courage, A Lighthouse to the World, for Medga, Fannie Lou, and Miss Annie Devine. And most of you know Medga, you know Fannie Lou. Miss Annie Devine was a school teacher, and she was one of the first school teachers who took uh, the state of Mississippi to task. Because if you were a school teacher in the 50s and 60s, if you were a member of the NAACP, you got fired. So Ms. Andy Devine was one of the first teachers who stood, and, and also a little side note, because I'm at Jackson State, so I can't go anywhere without mentioning the great Margaret Walker Alexander. Mm -hmm. um, when, so, Margaret Walker uh, Drive is where Megan Evers lives. So Margaret Walker, Megan Evers, y'all live on the same street. Well, the other teachers did not want Megan to move on that street, because they were afraid. And so it was Margaret Walker, who basically went to the other teachers, basically, and she bullied them <laughs> into letting make and, and that's important because another thing about Margaret is that, or Dr. Alexander's dad, she realized that she wasn't willing to compromise her faith to be a revolutionary, right? That she felt that she could be a Christian and a wife. And you have to understand in the 60s, because Christianity wasn't that popular in the black community, that many of the more revolutionary writers coming after her and coming after Richard Wright were denouncing Christianity, and they wanted her also to be much more of a feminist. And Margaret Walker was like, no, I can be a good wife, a good mother, a good Christian, and fight for liberation. We all argue that the reason you don't know Margaret Walker the way you should is because she can't be put in a box. Most of you know who Nikki Giovanni is, and Nikki Giovanni is one of the most popular writers come out of Black Art Movement. When Nikki Giovanni said, Margaret Walker Alexander is the most famous person nobody knows. Because in 1973, Margaret Walker Alexander was the only person on the planet who could send out a call so that all the major black writers could come to Jackson State and every one of them came. That tells you how powerful that Margaret, and also Margaret Walker and Eudora Wealthy were really good friends and really close. So if you ever go online, go on YouTube, look at some of those Eudora Wealthy, Margaret Walker, uh, in, they are Right. And you know what's great? The older they got, the more hilarious. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping to get to that age where you just get so old you don't care. You're not old you don't care. <laughs> right, right. You know, old people like, you know, skinny girl, come here, come get something to eat. <laughs> you know you're skinny, eat this, right? right. So that's that's kind of where all this is going. So this is this poem, uh, Missive Courage, The Lighthouse of the World, for Medgar, Fanny Lou, and Miss Annie Devine. Courage is a lighthouse guiding ships to salvation. Courage is the fire that burns down the dead weeds of racism that rise to suffocate the voices of liberty. Courage is the antibiotic that kills the bacteria of hatred. Courage was the nucleus of the Mississippi Trinity, three lamps full of freedom oil that shine the path to the dirt and gravel roads of liberation and ensure themselves with a sharecropper and a teacher. 
three instructors of liberation teaching that righteous deeds only bow before God and that the children of God have an unyielding organic duty to protect the meek like umbrellas, shielding us from the acid showers of colonialism or overcoats, shielding us from the frozen winds of prejudice. Three bucking broncos, railing against pale cowboys who lurk in the dark of the night, armed with the silver bullets of white supremacy. Three lambs of justice who boldly walked into the snake pit of the south into the lion's den of America to snatch their freedom from Ross Nebuchadnezzar, Barnett, Pharaoh, Billboard, and sidewinding salamander and scribes, the Jackson Daily News, and insurance sales with the sharecropper and the teacher bore the cross of change. They were the fertile soil in which we planted our seeds of hope as they petitioned us to invest the collateral of our talents into the mutual fund of the movement. That's why we must be tired of paper tired intellectuals and playboy revolutionaries who care more about their Cadillac payments than the tilling of the soil of every education as they are standing on the backs and trampling the fruit of men, the Fanny Lou and Miss Annie Divine. These three midwives had nurtured the germination of a movement which caused the rippling of flowers and trees sprouting into the winter of racism, into the spring of transformation like Shaka. They were the pounding tum tum heart of a militant movement like Jesus. They came to heal the sick and like Muhammad. They laid down the blueprint for their people still, everyday people fighting for everyday concerns, speaking volumes with their actions. This trinity shook the fires of the universe through intellectual guerrilla, guerrilla warfare with the spirit of Jomo Kenyatta. They showed that leaders cannot teach people to stand as tall as mighty magnolia trees if they are themselves weeping willows bowing on their knees to the winds of wrongdoers. These three embrace the sword of justice and the fires of protest, becoming ministers of justice and preachers of the gospel of freedom, teaching us to be the engine of organizations rather than been driven and plowed over by them. With very little possessions, they fought for the dispossessed, each one crying 900,000 Jubilee tears for 900,000 of right and walker citizens at the mercy of miseducated teachers and chicken eating preachers, all the while refusing to fight the forest of fire of evil with evil, believing that love is the only antidote to hate. But when held to the light of truth, courage is the mirrored reflection of love and no greater love than he who would lay down his silvery cast be a cold of life for another. So that we may walk unblemished over the cesspool of struggle, his pavement, to be beaten, kicked, sprayed, spit on fire, lied, bummed, and turned out for his own for a few crumbs of token possessions and just enough money to move across the tracks into the homes that pale people abandoned to preserve the marmalade of Mississippi tradition and the bloodstained name of emancipation, equality, and liberty and the thick sweet potato aroma of their lingering legacy demands that we heed the call to explode this corrupt cocoon into a capital city of concrete citizens. So I don't know if I'm going to heaven or hell, but wherever I'm going, I'm going. For Mississippi, I'm going. For Mississippi, thank you. So, I didn't even get into the uh, Civil Rights Museum yet. Okay, all right. Did you go to the, the little portals that have the videos, right? Did you go to the one for Meg Evers? Yes, no, no, yes, no. Go back to the good. Good, go again. I wrote that one. So that's a little shameless plug. <laughs> uh, uh, so I always said it. Right. So, but uh, I'm going to do one last poem. And this is, let me see the hands of my native Mississippians. Right? Okay, good. So my native Mississippians, you'll understand this. Whenever we travel, especially in America, you always get a question and then there's a movement that comes with the question. The question is, what's Mississippi like? And then they take one step back. And the way they the way they phrase the question is almost like you can replace Mississippi with Mars. Like, what's Mars like? <laughs> And you know, I, I, I used to be offended by that, but uh, I just went blank. My man, uh, uh, Bob Moses. Bob Moses used to say that when you're in Mississippi, the rest of the world doesn't seem real. And when you're outside of the world, Mississippi doesn't seem real. And so, you, you know, when I was a young, stupid, arrogant college wannabe poet, <laughs> I, I read Margaret Walker's For My People. And if you haven't read Mark Walker's for my people, that's one of those poems like when you read, you're like, I won't be doing this long. <laughs> <laughs> you know, man, you, 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 I mean, you just get What I tell young poets is understand what Elliot said, right? Right? In the, um, um, what is it, the tradition and the individual talent? What is that? Yeah. Tradition and the individual talent? Yeah. Is that? Okay, cool. So I wanted to make sure I was like, I think that's if I can't remember. So th th those two 
essay, Elliot's essay, Tradition and Individual Talent, and uh, Langston Hughes is uh, The Negro Writer and the Racial Mouth. I love those two essays. And so what Elliot says in his essay is that the job of the poet is to learn and study the canon of history and then find your niche in it, right? So you're not trying to outright the people who influence you. You're just trying to be influenced by the people who influence you. Does it make sense? And so this was a poem that, I'm going to read half of it. And what's sad is that even when I read half of it, you're going to be like, that must be a really long poem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to half of it is long, right? But this was me being inspired. But it was also trying to answer when people say, what's Mississippi like? So it's, it's simply titled Mississippi Life. What is it to be Mississippi? Where Capitol streets cross cotton fields and Margaret's Jubilee jams with the Doors festivals and even when they have college cuts controversy and the Klan with plenty of revolution, religion, and red, white tomatoes and rebels, ruby, racist flags. This is all my Mississippi. It's little boys putting dirt in abandoned tires and rolling them by little girls in their Sunday dresses. It's hanging out at Big Sam's Juke Joint on Saturday night and juking the sign me up on Sunday morning. It's picking wild berries and stealing Mr. Wilson's plums. It's mowing everybody's yard because your mama said so. <laughs> it's where time out means mama taking a break from whooping your literary high. <laughs> and the thought of a swarming strap still causes you to wake up in the middle of the night in a James Brown cold sweat. <laughs> it's Ross Barnett damning the doorway of education and James Barrett bulldozing his ideology. It's the Sovereignty Commission playing hide and go seek with the lives of invisible citizens and every voices declare we shall not, we shall not be moved under the salacious sights of rifles and German shepherds. What is it to be Mississippi? It's no matter how highbrow we get, we still have hot sauce on the table when we eat. It's having a special job wrong for being double forced by being bilingual and lingual enough to talk with two tongues, you know, a Democrat on TV and a Dixocrat under the heel. Wearing black suits in the day and white suits, white suits at night. It's cinnamon and coffee leaves hanging from faded olive trees, a warm Thanksgiving and a cool Christmas where rain still center stage from the snow. And a brief frost can close school like the notion of the ending segregation. <laughs> As apartheid is kept alive every Sunday morning. We still don't pray together, even though our children can hopscotch over the old miss and play together. What is it to be Mississippi? It's the peanut butter and jelly sandwich of Archie Manning and Walter Payton with some like peanut butter more than jelly, but half the sandwich rarely fills a whole belly. It's the quiet confusion that becomes too cantankerous to ignore. It's when the doctor says that today is the day to stop eating pork. Or when the poor politics of the good old boy kickbacks become too fat and to nurture democracy. What is it to be Mississippi? It's having two streets with, sorry, it's having one street with two names so that the white folks can live on Hanging Moss and the black folks can live on West Street. Until the black folks march up the street and then the Confederates move to Rankin County. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies to Rankin County. <laughs> it just worked for the public. <laughs> it's being the mirror of the world with the Christ of Chrome reflection is too bright to face. To be Mississippi is knowing that decency, courage, and forgiveness are not a three-piece suit that can be removed when they are no longer fashionable. Like when you say yes ma'am and no ma'am because manners are the concrete foundation of civilization, that's the Mississippi in you. When you open the door for a woman, not as a prelude to a rendezvous, but because women are the fertile soil of our futures, that's the Mississippi in you. When a family reunion ain't nothing but a Sunday dinner, that's the Mississippi in you. Or when you send a plate over to Miss Mary's house because all her children took the exit train off and she can't navigate the stairs like she used to, that's the Mississippi in you. Or when you go to school because education is a sledgehammer to knock holes in the walls of injustice and oppression, that's the Mississippi in you. Or when you vote, even though there are two flapjack politicians on both sides of the ballot, <laughs> and the concept of statesmen is nothing more than a mascot for Delta State, <laughs> yet you pull the lever anyway because Mega's blood is the only registration card you need, that's the Mississippi in you. When being baptized in the blood refers to the plasma of Jesus and the crimson of the civil rights movement, that's the Mississippi in you. When you speak to people whom you don't know when you pass them on the streets, that's the Mississippi in you. And after speaking to them, you say, who your folks, baby? <laughs> <laughs> that's the Mississippi in you. Or when you see a stranger with a familiar face and ask him, baby, are 
you miss Gucci Mae Johnson pose just over the track under the head had that daughter man just with his on the stove next to the sawmill in? <laughs> That's the Mississippi in you. Or when you got a whole, whole lot of cousins, <laughs> and your mom and dad ain't got no brothers and sisters. <laughs> That's showing up the Mississippi in you. <laughs> when you stand because a woman just approached your table, that's the Mississippi in you. When you refuse to call a woman after 10 o'clock in anything but her name, that's the Mississippi in you. When loving your fellow man as you love yourself is your political platform and feeding little Leroy is your social warfare program, that's the Mississippi in you. And when you pay your bills despite them vampire interest rates, not because you're scared of those colorless collectors, but because your granddaddy's word was as solid as the earth and your daddy's word was as true as the seasons and you don't want to drive down the value of your family's name by being as unreliable as a politician promised one day after the election. That's the Mississippi in you. And when you do unto others as you would have them do unto you because it pleases God and your grandma, that's the Mississippi in you. Thank you. Chicago, 
I called a bunch of pseudo cycle revolutionary writers I in. Yeah, it was like, I'm, and so I was like, you ain't never pick cotton touch and I was talking about cotton and all. And, and so I, you know, my thing was I was gonna take my poem and make them all man walk on a jail. <laughs> That's right. I got to the last line and the place is erupted. Like with laughing, I'm like, no! You're supposed to be mad! You're supposed to be angry! This is not how this is supposed to work! But what happened was, as I was walking out, right, because again, everybody there was telling me a story about their uncle or their grandparent from the South, right? And it was one of those things, that was the first time I realized that, you know, you guys know this probably a lot earlier than I do, is that the South is the backbone of the rest of the country. Right, in the good and the bad. Right, my father used to always complain about he's tired of the fact that Mississippi educates the rest of the world. I thought, what do you mean Mississippi educates the rest of the world? He said, no matter the university, we give the finest education, but our children can't get jobs here. He said, we have to get tired of the fact that children who are born and raised in Mississippi, love Mississippi, can't live here, can't work here, because we've allowed classism and racism to stifle our progression. Right, and so that was the first time. So. Once I started reading Mississippi Light, it was amazing that when I would leave the South, that would be one of the poems that people would request. And it was just that they would they could see themselves and, 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 and hear themselves. And it, it makes me think about, and I want to get it right, I know I should I know I should know this. I don't I can't remember if it was Death of a Salesman or the Postman Always Rings Twice. Which of the play, which one is it that the play opens with a shot of the household? And you can see the kitchen. Does anybody remember? Definitely say, okay, so I remember being in like sixth grade, curtains open, and my mother would always drag me to plays, and I would be mad because you're sixth grade. Right? <laughs> you had the suits, it looked like the 70s, so all the suits itched, right? <laughs> so you just get your suit, you gotta go to this play, and I'm sitting there, and I'm mad. I can't say nothing because my mama was a master of the backhand, so <laughs> just kind of live through it, and hope you keep all your teeth. And the curtain opened, and there was something on the wall, and I remember the first thing I was like, so literally the first time I'd ever been in a white person's house was at that play. Now that's metaphorically speaking, but everybody understand the point I'm making? Yeah. That I made that connection through art. So that's so that, that what sentimentality does, what writers don't know, is that you really don't allow people to make a real emotional connection. Right? Because you're reaching for the low-hanging fruit, right? You're reaching for the overly romanticized, and what we realize is facing the most rigidly raw thing in the world, right, is what I think connects you. So, so what I find is, so what I try to do is not say Mississippi is, you know, bad, Mississippi is good. I just try to kind of deconstruct some things and provide some artifacts and then do it in a kind of artistic way. If you notice, my biggest thing is imagery. Uh, that's, that's, that's my calling card. That's my thing. I'm, um, I'm not a big structured person. I write a lot of haiku. I publish, I think, three haiku in, in, in magazines, but I write haiku simply for the exercise. Uh, I like sonnets. But I like sonnets only because I like the question and answer, right? I'm not writing a hybrid, it just ain't gonna happen, right? <laughs> but I, 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 I do think that, I mean, you, you can't read Militants when I consider how my life has been. One of my favorite sonnets is Shakespeare's 138, uh, about the old dude and the young chick, right? <laughs> Baby, I still got it. She said, yeah, daddy, you still got it. Said, I know she lying, I ain't got it. <laughs> right, right. So, and, and those of you who are young, trust me, when you get older, you will like those lies, right? Like, you know. So, yeah, so I, I, I think that what I try to do is to be the specific in, in, in presenting specific elements in a poem and, and having try to people connect with that rather than, and, and, and having, the last part, I guess, is trying to have I don't think my solution is the only solution. I just don't like art that doesn't propose any solution, right? I, 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 I understand art can be for venting. I'm not against art. Sometimes, you know, you know Tupac and, and, and you know, the people who know me know me, because I'm like the least hip hop person on the planet, <laughs> uh, which, which kind of gives you some of how old I am. Put it this way, I've listened to the radio since 1988, so they tell you how old I am. <laughs> but Tupac said that I may not know the answer, but if I keep talking about the question, maybe somebody will answer. So I'm not averse or opposed to poets discussing the problem. I just think that at some point, we have to be willing to stand on some type of solution just to keep the conversation. I don't mind somebody telling me I disagree with the solution you, because that at least begins a conversation. So yeah, so I, I'm, I'm like you, I think sentimentality, it, it just, it destroys the poem and you, you really
really are not giving your reader the opportunity to be critical. So yeah, I don't know if that answer. Did I answer right? I think I think I can't answer that question. Yeah. Right, cool. We're here. Anybody else? Come to me and Dr. Posse to talk to each other. All right, go ahead. All right. Um, so I've been I've been writing down a lot of stuff, but I think I figured out a way to condense it all down into like one question. And but I'm trusting you to give me your unadulterated opinion. See, he knows you, so that's that's like the setup. <laughs> you know, that's like see he's a gentleman right here, they know me, right? That's the setup. I'm just letting you know now. I'm keeping my job, man. <laughs> <laughs> So three people. Okay. Um, Angie Thomas. Okay. Jasmine Ward. Okay. Casey Lane. Okay. Can you talk about the relationship that black writers have with capitalism? Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about capitalism. You want to be around it, especially as it relates to the black community. So let's start with Lucy. Their writing styles. Let's start with Lucy Terry and Phyllis Wheaton. Okay, so Lucy Terry has a poem, Bar Spice. If you've never read Bar Spice, it's the first poem published by an uh, African American uh, writer. It's a poem about Native Americans that raid and kill their white family, right? I have a hard time seeing that act of Native Americans as terror. I see it as revolution and self defense, right? But Lucy Terry, a black writer, writes from the perspective of the white family, right? She writes with the sympathies of the white family. What I've always said is that when that poem had been published, had she written from the sympathies of the Native Americans? Phyllis Wheatley, what's her most famous poem? On being brought from Africa to America. What she says that Christianity, that she said that slavery was a good thing because slavery allowed me to become a Christian. It's a very myopic way to understand it because you really understand the Old Testament, you really understand Abraham, you really understand the kingdom of Cush. Africans were slaves, I'm sorry, were Christians, some Africans about 200 years before it got to you. So that's a whole, no, Phyllis, you didn't have to be enslaved <laughs> to be a Christian. But, so to come to your point, from the very moment we started publishing, black writers have always had to do this dance about how do I appease white publishers and white readers, right? What's phenomenal about the Black Arts Movement is that the Black Arts Movement is the first time black writers started writing to black people. And that's not me begrudging the Harlem Renaissance, right? Because Langston Hughes was about writing to black writers, but he was one of the few. Because black people just didn't have the money, right? If you're gonna sell books, if you're gonna publish, right? So when people say, well, why do you always say we need to study the, the, the Black Arts Movement as much as the Harlem Renaissance? One single thing. The Harlem Renaissance produced one independently owned journal. Anybody know the name of it? Fire. And I like the name of it because the reason they had only one issue, because after that issue, the building burned down. <laughs> now, I know that's not funny, but to me, because I'm a jerk, that's funny. I'm sorry. Right? You name your magazine Fire, and you can't have another issue because the building burns down. The Black Arts Movement. 19 individual self-sustaining literary journals designed for and by and about black people. So the question is, why do you know more people from the Harlem Renaissance and you don't know just about anybody from the black art? And, 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 so I'm coming to that. So Amir Baraka, I argue, is one of, if not the most important writers in American history, not black writers, because he changed literature three times. When he was Leroy Jones, how many of you know who the beat writers are? How many of you know the beat writers? Okay, well, here's what you need to know about the beat writers. They were all trying to be Leroy Jones, <laughs> right? So that's right there. And he published them. They didn't publish him, right? So that's that's one. He is driving American literature. Then he became a black nationalist. He creates the Black Arts Movement, and every other black writer gets on board, right? So he changes the course of American literature. Then he fell out with capitalism. He found he could no longer be a capitalist. And there were other writers of the Black Arts Movement, uh, primarily Ishmael Reed, who was like, hey, Barack, I ain't trying to be broken there. So <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna hold on to this capitalist thing. But Rock becomes a Marxist, Marxist ends the Black Arts Movement, okay? So what begins happening is that only Nikki Giovanni and Sonny Sanchez are the surviving names that, you know, Baraka was just so much better than everybody. So you couldn't deny Baraka, you couldn't deny Reed, right? So those, you weren't, but there were so many others who were good, they weren't superstars, they were good.
good, who you should know, who should be published, who should be in anthologies. The Black Arts Movement was not about protesting, because protesting is about asking. The Black Arts Movement was about being solid, right? We're not gonna actually be nice to us, just don't bother us so we can create our own institutions. So what happens is that they all get banished to an island. So much so that many of the young black writers today do everything they can not to be associated with the black arts movement. So fast forward to the people that you are discussing. Uh, I raised this question in an article. I actually raised it. The essay is actually in an essay, a collection of essays edited by Jasmine Moore, right? So I raised this question. So rank uh, Yeah. She has a collection of poetry citizen, right? I cool. There's a moment in that collection, and by the way, I, I like this. Whenever, because I read this on people, and it's funny, but you know, people take what they want. I actually like the, the, the collection of citizens. But there's a moment where the speaker, who's been suffering from racial, racial trauma, goes to see a white psychiatrist. I mean, let me get this straight now. So you're suffering from racial trauma, and to heal your racial trauma, you're gonna go see a white psychiatrist. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm 50 pages into the book now, I'm along for the ride. You know, <laughs> those of you know, you've been reading books, and the book goes this way, you're like, I'm, 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 I'm 50, 75 pages in. I've got to there you go, I gotta finish it now, right? You, see, you all feel right. So, what happens is that the psychiatrist doesn't know that this is a patient because I guess she's made the appointment by phone. The psychiatrist said, Get out of my yard, get away from me, leave, right? And so, the point was for Rankin to paint a picture of how bad white supremacy is. So when Kiese was here at the book festival, his articles that with Jasmine Woods, my question was, how long will we complain about how bad white supremacy is until we get to a point where we start writing poems and short stories and essays about black independence? The problem is there's no money in black independence. And the reason there's no money in black independence is not just because white publishers won't publish it, is because the vast majority of black people will not embrace black independence over integration. So it's really, they are stuck in the same conundrum that the writers of the Hall of Renaissance is. You can discuss how bad white supremacy is, but you can never promote any kind of real solutions of independence. And so, I'll give you a perfect example. The two major literary journals, black literary journals, are Cali and African literary. Obsidian is, 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 should be more known, but people don't know about Obsidian. But African American Review, right? The second most known literary journal for 30 years was edited by white editors, right? A husband and wife team, right? Here's something you need to know about Cali. Cali was actually started in two by Dr. Jerry Ward and Charles Brown. Charles Rao, and I'm glad you, I'm glad this is being videotaped, because uh, he, he I said this before, so he can sue me. I will be there. He hijacked Calhoun, stole it, took Jerry Ward's name off of it because he got money from Texas in it. That's what happened to Calhoun, right? And I tell anybody, go look at the first four issues of Calhoun. Jerry Ward, Charles Rao, and two other men, their names are equal as editors. Then about the fourth and fifth issue, the only name on there is Charles Brown. So as long as your purse strings, right, come from your oppressors or people who have power over you, then you are very limited. Now, does that mean that they don't create great art? No, they create really good art. The question becomes, is your art all it could be when you know that there's a limit in what you can say? Uh, Angie Thomas, if you haven't read The Hate You Give, it's a really good book. Uh, a lot of people complain that the movie doesn't do what the novel does. Very few movies do. Right? Just, I mean, you know, I'm not I'm not knocking it, but very few movies do. Um, the, the, I like it. I enjoy, I enjoy the book. I enjoyed the movie. I'm one of those people who don't have problems with the book. Uh, I think of the three, her book came the closest to discussing self-determination. Go ahead. Can I ask? So, I was a teacher, and all of my kids ate up Andy Thomas's book. And, and the argument for, you know, even when you're interacting within the capitalistic space, she's writing to children, and she's giving representation on the page mm -hmm. to children who don't feel represented on the page in, in mm -hmm. you know, a larger context of right. children's literature. I guess my whole question is like, I mean, Black Panther goes back to the same thing. Mm -hmm. So like, that's why Black Panther is venerated. And I mean, like, 
That'll be a discussion we have later after all y'all go home. <laughs> <laughs> Read Max and uses the essay first, and the Negro artists and 
Generation Mount, the white dancing in September in Bamboo, because this is what happened to me. So in my collection of short stories, I have a short story where it's based around Jackson State, but I didn't call it Jackson State, so it's called Onyx State. Get it? Onyx Black? Yeah. It was, <laughs> all right. So, so it's OSU Onyx State University, right? Black State University. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> don't lose me for that. All right. So, what happens is one of their friends get killed. So they decide that they are going to identify because one of their friends has an internship at the police department. So they're going to identify and they're going to kill one drug dealer every week. That's, so that's just that, that's the plot. And he's honest that that's the plot, right? So what happens is. They do that for two or three weeks, and I have like uh, the clan lie, I mean the clan legend. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead and break. Uh, I'm, I'm still salty from the AS case. Uh, so uh, I have the papers and media, and people talking about is it a good idea? So have, I have some people saying it's a great idea that they're doing this, I have other people saying it's a bad idea, and have all these kind of archetype figures in there. So what happens is, after the fourth, fifth week, what they didn't realize was that when you kill one drug dealer, that's a symptom, that's not the problem. It's just next man up. It's worse. Yeah, it's so the next guy that they're about to kill out to the fourth fifth person is the cousin of one of the students. Mm -hmm. And they were raised like brothers. Now you guys about a book to find out what happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I put it. Capitalism, right? So, so, but here's what happened. So there was a small publisher that wanted to option that book. And he said, hey, what your people want. Your story is not violent enough. That's literally what he said. It's a story about killing. <laughs> like every week. <laughs> <laughs> and he literally looked at me and he says, no, but your people need more. At this point, I, you know how like you check out the meeting, the meeting's not over, but it's over for you. So you just start saying the most egregiously crazy stuff you can say. <laughs> so I said, and you know what needs to be understood? He says, what? I said, not only should they kill more people, there should be orgies after the killing. And he looks at me and goes, now you're getting a little bit of get back to the wrong <laughs> That's the racial mountain that the black writer faces, right? That for whom are you writing? Who's your audience, right? And are you willing to take less for free? And, and that really is the, the conundrum for black writers is, you know, my, I, and if you go to my website, Psychedelic Literature, or there's, a, there's an article that I wrote uh, titled, uh, that was after reading 25 collections of black poetry in 25 days. Let me, let me warn you, it's a, an extremely long essay. It's so long that when I was writing it, I was like, I'm not reading this again. <laughs> I just, I'm just not like, you know, I just, you know, but it's extremely, extremely long. But it, 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 my, my question is, why has black poetry gotten more and more obscure after Rita Dove wins the Pulitzer, right? So you have Brendan Brooks win the Pulitzer, then you have Rita Dove wins the Pulitzer, and then Tasha Trethway, then, well, Jess, the guy Jess, and then Tracy Smith. And more and more black writers are writing in this hieroglyphic code that only people like us. But my question is, how are you writing for and about the mass of black people if you're writing things that they can't read? And there used to be a balance between subject and form. I think form is important. I think form is equally important to subject. Right? I don't want to read your terrible poem about revolution. Right? I want to be real clear. I want to read your terrible poem when you just said revolution 18 times. That's not a poem. <laughs> That's just you saying revolution 18 times. Right? But we've gotten to the point where black writers see the dollars and understand the dollars. And they write poems that they themselves don't need to understand. Like, like when, when the blurb on the back of the book says, Poetry doesn't have to be understood to be good. <laughs> what you're saying is nobody understands this crap. <laughs> right? And, and that's the only thing that I can get from that. And so yeah, so I so I think that there's a there's a narrow pot. There are very few people at the table. And the most noted black writers know that. And they just decided, a lot of them, not all of them, 
I would say someone that you guys should check out who's kind of walking that and has been able to kind of win awards and be published is a guy named Clint Smith. Yeah. And so Clint Smith is his book, uh, County Descent. It's a it's a really, really good book. So I would say check out Clint Smith's book. And if you email me, there's a couple of like, yes sir, please. So does poetry have to then move out of publishing it into performance? Does it have to become more performance? And now I'm thinking about spoken word, I'm thinking about all of that. I, I would say that what it has to do is stop having to think that it has to make a decision between the two. Uh, in fact, in my article, I quote this rare, this, and so you, in my article, there's this great article about what's called poetry books. And so these scholars actually do an empirical study. They take some of the most noted writers, going all the way back to uh, Frost, and they basically linguistically graph their, their performances. And because they're looking for the quote poetry voice, because what they found was the other thing that black writers were doing were trying to be more and more Frost like, or the hour writers because that made them more palatable to, 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 to white audiences. So the problem is that even in the performative, if you're performing for an audience that doesn't want you to sound like yourself, mm -hmm. right, right, then you still lose that dynamic. So I, I think the question has to be, can we get back to poets having a middle ground of, I want to be well crafted on the page, and I want to be just as moving in the, in the performative, uh, the, 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 other, the other point of that is that what we found is that people who tend to regularly come to poetry readings don't buy books. So then you are then forced to become just a performance poet if you're saying I want to do it to make a living, right? And so that's, that's, that's the other component of it. Uh, I want to say something about there needs to be just uh, we get, we'll get this whole discussion about there just needs to be a discussion of integrity, but you know, I'm not in a position to tell somebody how to get their check. I'll give, I'll give you a quick story. There was a young man who was an English major at Jackson State, and his whole goal was to you know, get his PhD and come back and work at Jackson State. His parents were Jackson State graduates, my parents were Jackson State graduates. He was one of my students. He loved you know, he wanted to come back and get his degree. And I was like, great, that's good, that's good. Just let's get the degree. So when he got his master's, he came back to talk, we got his PhD. And he got his PhD, and a week after he got his PhD, he got an offer from a school that was 35% more than what Jackson State could pay. And he asked me, what should I do? <laughs> I can't tell somebody young what to do. Like, you know, what I'm saying, being broke by Mr. Mackenzie, it's not. But that's, you know, so th that's the conundrum is, how many people, you know, I knew I was going to be a broke writer, so I decided not to have biological children. I'm not saying everybody should have that choice. I, I specifically said that I'm going to be a broke writer in a room flat in front of a typewriter, and that's what I'm down. But I can't ask anybody else, right? For me, it was if you don't have children, then you don't have to worry about money. 